Hello and welcome to this Automation Academy Mastering the Machine webinar for April 30th, 2021. My guest was Dave Griffith, known for the Manufacturing Hub podcast and a systems integrator. Hope you enjoy it. This is a Mastering the Machine webinar, which I do every two weeks as part of the Automation Academy, which is a what's called a membership site. Uh, it's similar to some other people who have uh, websites that they do different kinds of training and post items of interest. And uh, what I what I do is a lot of times I just, you know, provide some kind of information, but I've been having guests now, I think on every webinar except for one since November when I started this. And I, I don't know that I intended to do that, but I did intend to have something every two weeks. Why? Because this membership academy group that I'm a part of says that's what you should do. If you're going to have a website, you need to engage with people. And so you should have an event of some kind, actually more like weekly, but I can't do a webinar weekly. I probably couldn't fill it. So that's uh, why I do this. And it looks like there's Tim too. Very cool. Uh, so anyway, that's, that's what this is all about. Um, what is this and where did it start from? Uh, I actually created a document about, uh, gosh, years ago, uh, about eight years ago now, and it was called Mastering the Machine. And it was about uh, specifying equipment, right? Specifying uh, machinery for plants, which I, you know, I've worked for some big machine builders and own my own custom machine building company. And so uh, I put that document out right after I left a company called Wright Industries, which is a big machine builder. And it was just informational, right? I had a blog at the time, that's this automation primer. And I kind of threw that out there as a, what's called a lead magnet. So for those of you who have done websites and things, what people do is often they'll put something out there that will get uh, people to subscribe to your newsletter, which I don't have, I don't have a newsletter, uh, and they will uh, get their email, right? That's the, that's the sneaky part of all this. You get their email. And I collected these emails for years and did nothing with them. Why? Because I, at the time, I had nothing to sell. I don't sell things like Tim does. So uh, Tim sells things and he sells services. And he does uh, lots, of, lots of neat stuff. Uh, I didn't have that at the time. As a matter of fact, I'd just gone into contracting and I already had enough customers. I'm a one-person company, so I already have plenty of business. So uh, when I started this website, uh, all of a sudden I started getting feedback saying, you know what, we're not here to take your PLC classes. And I was shocked, right? Um, oh, did it flip pages? Yeah, it did. So I was shocked. I thought, oh, everybody's gonna join to take PLC classes. But you know, there's guys like Paul Lynn uh, and, uh, and of course Vlad Romanoff, uh, Sean Tierney, some well-known guys, they already have lots of PLC classes. I didn't want to compete with them. I don't want to just uh, have another set of PLC class, uh, you know, videos, but I teach live. I've been doing that since about 2013 also for a company called Automation Training out of Canada. Now that ended, right? Because a year ago I had a tornado come through and destroy my facility and then the pandemic hit. And so I don't teach a lot of live classes, but ironically next week I have one in Mount Juliet, Tennessee, right next to here seven students coming in from factories all over the place and I'll be teaching control logics. But uh, most of that's over, right? So I got feedback from the guys saying, you know, we're not really here for your PLC classes. We've all joined because we wanna learn something from you about machine building and systems integration. And I was like, okay, well, that's cool, except now I have all this PLC stuff. Uh, so I need to start something new. So one of the things I started is this podcast, right? This webinar, whatever you call it. And the other thing I started is a course called Mastering the Machine. So far, I only have one video in it and it's all about, it's about what Doug Allward, who was one of my guests here, was talking about, which is specifying machinery, right? Uh, he, he said, well, before you ever get into quoting machines, you have to form a relationship with a customer, et cetera. So that's where this came from. Uh, enough about that. This is part of that series. And now my guest, which I have a guest every, uh, every two weeks so far, except for, like I said, one episode, my guest this week is Dave Griffith. And Dave is really active on LinkedIn. And of course he has a podcast of his own with Vlad Romanoff, who was a guest here about a month ago. 
And uh, they do the manufacturing hub with Dave and Vlad. And I attend several of those, always good information. They also have guests and talk about all kinds of different topics. So that is a great place where you can learn about things. And I don't have a direct link for that. I get all my links from, uh, from LinkedIn, right? When I see it pop up. Uh, so Dave may tell you more about exactly how to find that link. Uh, also, uh, you know, I always thought this was a really cool picture up here of Dave. You know, it's a, you can see Dave in person here and he yeah. really does kind of look like that, except yes, yes, he does have a, an amazing beard. Um, I, I have tried to do things like that before. During the pandemic, I grew a little beard and wore a funky uh, hat and did a hillbilly impersonation as part of my, <laughs> part of my webinar. But uh, I've never been able to grow anything over maybe an inch. Uh, and, and Dave's obviously been doing this for a while. <laughs> uh, so about Dave, I took this straight from a post that I believe he put uh, on here the other day. I help manufacturing companies go through transformational processes that pay for themselves. Uh, <clears throat> and here's some of the bullet points that he put in there, figure out where to start your process. Uh, and we've talked a lot about industry 4.0 digital transformation, as many other people also talk about uh, this. There's a lot on that on the internet, but I'll let Dave uh, explain a little of that himself. And if uh, Dave, if you have a PowerPoint or anything, I can turn screen control over to you. And I can also, this is one of the cool things I found on Dave's website is Dave has a digital transformation quick start guide, which I went I through. And that is a step-by-step, -step, you know, how you, how you uh, start the digital, uh, digital transformation process. So I can also bring that up if Dave would like to go through that. But at this point, uh, I'd like to kind of turn it over to Dave. Well, th thank you, Frank. And I think I should start off by telling you that I'm a little scared. I was going back through re-listening to the conversation that you and Vlad had. And I think you dug up a, a blog post of his from like 15 years ago where he made a single mention of woodworking. And I'm like, man, Frank is like the best private detective in the industrial automation community. He knows things about people that I don't. And I've had, converse, I've had at least one conversation with Vlad, I think every week for like the last five months. And uh, no idea, he, uh, there, there was a brief moment that he was, uh, he was into woodworking. And so I, uh, I, I have to let everyone know that I am a, a little scared uh, for this. But no, no, th thank you very much for, uh, for having me on. I was going back through uh, kind of listening to uh, to some of the other episodes, I'm I'm excited as to where this conversation is going to go. Uh, I think that there are a couple of routes, and and I, my thought was we'll, we'll have the conversation. I, I won't try to uh, throw up a PowerPoint slide and do like the uh, the sales guy thing, if you will. But uh, let's see where it goes and see what sort of uh, questions that I can answer. Uh, a couple of comments, kind of before we get into this part of industrial automation. If you guys want to check out the old Manufacturing Hub episodes, we have a website. It's manufacturinghub.live uh, where you guys can check that out. And most, almost every Wednesday at six o'clock East Coast time, including this coming Wednesday, uh, we are live on LinkedIn and Twitch and YouTube and, and all of those places that you can normally find things. Uh, now, now I feel like I've done the, the semi-professional podcaster thing. Uh, thank you for uh, thank you for letting me have that spiel, Frank. Uh, but but yeah, so let me let me dig into kind of my, my my tagline, right? So you know, I help manufacturing companies go through transformational processes that pay for themselves, and that for me is the summation of all of the of the last you know five to ten years of work that I've done. And so throughout my career, it's, you know, I, I spent some time working for an OEM machine builder, uh, designing a bunch of things. I spent some time working for a distributor manufacturers rep. I did the, the startup thing. And even I, I laugh, uh, the, the startup thing was a smart medical device that of course included more manufacturing than, than I realized when I, uh, when I'm like, yes, yeah, I can do this. And, oh yes, I, I have a background in this. And then it's like, Okay, let, let's figure out how to injection mold this. Let's figure out how to go take it through the uh, the FDA process, which is ironically part of the reason why I don't spend a lot of time um, working in pharma or, or medical devices because uh, a lot of paperwork, Frank. A lot of uh, a lot of paperwork in um, in that. But no. So throughout the course of my career, it's kind of led me to the the process of 
I find that there are lots of companies that want to go through transformational processes. And I, I know we, we, you have kind of uh, poked fun on some of the, uh, uh, on some of these in the past and how they're, they're buzzwords. But uh, for, for me, it's a, there's a transformational process that we need to go through, whether it be hardware or software or training or any of those other, you know, kind of large buckets in order to help an organization become better. And throughout the course of my career, I've had some really good conversations. And then at some point, many of those conversations, if they're not the right organization who is planning to do this, they kind of stall. And I find that they stall because you're not having the correct value prop, right? You're not having the correct conversations with the people, be it the, the CFO, uh, somewhere, someone high enough in the organization to go through, you know, a multiple hundred thousand dollar process is going to have to say, yes, we're going to spend this money on it. And I have found that time and time again, I see either projects that don't get off the ground or projects that don't fulfill their full potential because no one or not enough people are considering what the end outcome looks like. And that's where the, uh, the pay for themselves go, right? So if we go through a process, process is aligned to our goals and our KPIs and what actually matters to us as a company, if we of that, in the bottom line, in the revenue, and it's going to create a really good return on investment. And as I talk about in the digital transformation quick start guide, I talk about dreaming big and starting small because the the largest process is you have to gather uh, adoption, user adoption, user engagement in order to go through the process to make sure that that they actually work. I've seen, as I'm sure many people here, you know, you could go do a five million dollar CapEx project, it could have been drawn on a whiteboard, we could have a set of requirements. And then at the end, the end outcome of that is we deploy a system without ever talking to the folks on the factory floor. And then when we deploy that system, it completely misses what we are what we are looking and trying to do. And so for me, this is kind of a, a you know, combination of, of learnings that uh, that I've put together. Yeah, a lot of this is, uh, you know, kind of Six Sigma lean stuff also. And uh, I remember years ago, one of the things I, I wrote in a blog was about buy-in, right? Mm -hmm. um, it, you, you have to get buy-in from uh, stakeholders in the process. And uh, one of the things I noticed when I would go into some plants is that they created, uh, they treated it like a, a private club rather than letting everybody into, into it. And not only do you need buy-in from the upper levels of management, you need buy-in from the people on the floor because they can actually sabotage what you're doing or if they're not on board, right, they can create problems. So uh, you don't wanna create a, a, a Lean Six Sigma club that all the black belts and the green belts and the yellow belts are private members of that nobody else is involved in. You need to get buy-in and let people know what you're doing, yeah. Absolutely. And, the, you know, there are lots of theories, you know, uh, Six Sigma theory of constraints, you know, there, there are lots of thoughts that people can go down. And I find that the most nimble organizations aren't necessarily sold on just one thing, right? They're, they're, they're sold. What's through this process and you know some of those groups have really good thought processes and you go down the thought process and it, it finds you a solution but it's not it's not always going to be that way and i find that uh you know especially as you were mentioning frank with the clubs like if they are there are a group of people that are not actively involved on being on the floor physically working in these systems then we're just not going to be able to understand the problem enough and understand the problem at the most granular level. Uh, so a, a really good example of that, uh, and I think I wrote a blog post on it, is doing a, uh, we were doing some work at a OEM manufacturer. They had a bunch of furnaces. Uh, we were doing some like HMI SCADA upgrades. As we were going through that process, you know, one of the controls engineers on the floor asked the question, or was like watching the HMI screen and the operator kind of offhanded made the comment, oh, it would be really great 
if I could just take these like 11 buttons that I have to press every single time and turn it into one button. And the, the long story short is you go through the process, you check it, you make sure that it's not going to cause an issue on the back end. It's still the same 10 or 11 buttons that you have to go through. And you go make the change so the operator now has to push one button. And those guys are actually able to go from like 10 loads a day to 11 loads a day in the furnace, which is, which is a huge value, you know, large multi-million dollar box furnace. I, I think I calculated, you know, the, the return on investment was like a million bucks for the first year for a single, you know, HMI screen redo. And the, and when I say start small, there are a lot of, you know, very small, almost inconsequential things that you can do at any facility in order to better understand what the workflow looks like. And if you can understand what their workflow looks like, then it becomes a, okay, let's do this. And again, towards the adoption, it becomes the, let's get some operator buy-in. Let's show them how it becomes easier. And then, th then we're going to have those champions on the floor. And I found that just about every time that I can get the champions as the operators on the floor, you know, we are going to have long-term success because I can show them that, yes, they do need to work with us a little bit, but even though they do need to work with us a little bit, it's going to make their lives easier. And at the end of the day, that, that's, that's what everyone wants, right? We want, to make every, we want to make a person's lives easier and we need to design systems and implement systems in order to, to do so. One of the things I've been curious about, uh, you know, last week we were both, I think, in the Western half of the United States. Mm -hmm. And I read up on, on some of the things you've done. And of course, you're a, uh, what I termed here as a digital nomad. I think you, yep. you, you use that term yourself. Um, so you're in, you're in Utah right now or Nevada or something like that. Yeah. So, so we're, we're currently in Nevada. I'm actually just outside of Las Vegas, getting ready to get on an airplane on okay. Sunday. So I'm getting on an airplane, heading to a client, uh, to go see a client on site for the full week for the first time. And the, for the first time in a while, it's, it's been the first time that I will have gotten on an airplane in like 14 months, which has been lo a longer stretch than probably any time in the six or seven years before that. Yeah, uh, I was curious about that. Uh, that's what I was going to ask is uh, when you deal with your clients, you know, how much of it is via Zoom and how much mm -hmm. of it is you go out to your client and, and you have to take a visit, right? Um, yes. So I, I would say that that has changed since the pandemic. Uh, so previous to the pandemic, uh, the, the general the, the, the general kind of format was you go, you have a couple of calls. Um, you know, you decide what the engagement looks like, and then you're probably spending time on site with the client uh, to go through and at least start the engagement. I find that the person to person uh, is, is, always, is always better, right? Like if I can go and talk to the folks and put hands on machines, even if I'm not doing anything, but like if I can go and have those conversations, uh, it, it makes it a much, it sets up the relationship much better. I would say in the last year, uh, there have been lots of those what I would term like discovery sort of meetings that didn't necessarily happen for a variety of reasons, right? So at the beginning of the pandemic, no one wanted folks on site. And then you know, there, there's always the question of safety and all of those other things. So um, I would drive to some clients depending upon where they were and, uh, and if it was close, but generally did not do nearly as much business travel. Um, yeah, I generally did not do as much business travel before. So uh, the year before that, the, most of the years before that, I was probably 60 to 120,000 flight miles a year um, going to fly to see clients. Uh, part, of, part, part of the reason why my wife and I started Kaplan uh, to, to go out on our own was to have a little bit more of that flexibility and of that freedom and to be able to find a better path in which it wasn't just, you know, once a month I'm getting on, you know, six airplanes and then I'm coming back and I'm sleeping through the weekend and then I'm up the, ne the next Monday to, uh, to go back to work. So uh, part of that was, uh, part of that was, was the kind of taking back some structure of the schedule. And again, I felt like, especially in the last year, there have been a lot more people who have adopted Zoom. I kind of laugh. I, I've had a Zoom subscription for the last four or five years. And uh, I've had many, many Zoom calls uh, over that time. But the I, I, I'm almost shocked 
some of the organizations that have gone to, you know, Zoom or Teams meetings that historically were like, we're going to be in the, everyone's got to be in the office every day. And, you know, the majority of their processes were on paper. So it certainly led to a shift. I think we're kind of start, starting to see, especially in some states, that shift coming back and people understanding and feeling the, the benefits of being able to meet in person. Absolutely. And so some of your clients, uh, would you say you've been working with for, for years? And so you already had a, a certain relationship with them. Oh, yeah. So a Zoom wasn't a big as big of a deal because you had a personal relationship with them. You had met them. A absolutely. Absolutely. So especially kind of at the beginning, when you go through like a discovery phase or a get to know you phase, I find that that's really beneficial to have those conversations. Um, as, as silly as it may sound, the ability to go and, you know, shake someone's hand and, and have coffee and go out to lunch with them. I'm not sure there's ever anything that is going to make up for that. But there have certainly been clients that I have had and had um, that I, I hadn't, you know, met face to face for some number of months for, for whatever reason, you know, it wasn't a good opportunity um, to, uh, to go face to face. But generally, I do my best to, to meet folks that I work with face to face, because I think that there is a large value in that either, you know, we go take a specific trip, or uh, meander around the country a little bit, you know, if they're well, a year ago, I would tell people that as I'm meandering around the country, I'm going to go see you guys. And then the pandemic hit, and then I had to wave to a few hundred people as I was uh, as I was driving by or through their cities. Um, but generally, historically, the as we're kind of in one place, it's been nice to be able to go have those conversations, if only to uh, to grab a cup of coffee. Absolutely, I think things are coming back. Of course, maybe the the handshake is becoming a fist bump now. Right. But, uh, but, but we ought, we do seem to be opening up a little more. And I honestly, I can't think of any clients I've ever had that I haven't met in person at mm -hmm. some point. So uh, forming those kind of relationships. Now I have a lot of people now that I, I, I would say I have relationships with, like we've talked and Vlad and I have talked uh, for over a year now um, that, that I've never met in person, but, mm -hmm. but clients are a different thing and it takes a certain yeah. amount of trust, Right and a relationship before you can uh, form a, a, bus a truly business relationship, I think, yeah. Absolutely, no, no, I would completely agree. And it'll be interesting to see what happens um, over the, the next year. There are still, almost like state to state, the restrictions vary, you know, widely as to, you know, people are in the office or people aren't in the office. Uh, so in Western New York, we're uh, like up near Buffalo or Beth and I have family towards the beginning of the pandemic, uh, you know, they were down to, you know, 25% capacity at most facilities and a lot of manufacturing kind of shut down there at, uh, at that point. So th there were a lot of places that it just wasn't possible or safe to, uh, to go visit. I, I would hope that as we come back, uh, and, and I laugh because I a year and a half ago, I didn't think I would ever say this. I hope that as we come back, there are more opportunities to go visit you know, manufacturing facilities because after like two or three months, it's like, man, like I haven't gone anywhere. How is the, how have I not gone anywhere and, and you know, gone to see this facility, even if it's just, you know, going and doing like a pre-sales or, or like going through the sales process to understand what's going on. And so it, it'll be nice and hopefully we can find that balance uh, and, and a balance that, uh, that makes sense. Uh, and, and again, to reiterate that point, I think it's very important to make sure that you can develop those relationships because a, as a consultant um, or as an integrator, you know, those relationships are kind of what set you apart. They are very much kind of, they're, they're the difference between someone spent paying the money to you or potentially paying the money to someone else who's close because they know them. And even though this is your specialty, you know, they, they know these guys, right? They've been working with these guys. They go golfing with them on Saturday mornings for the last 15 years. And relationships are a huge part of industry that maybe a lot of people don't uh, respect enough or, or understand the value of enough. Mm -hmm. So yeah, New York was in particular a problem. Uh, I, I did a class actually in September in, in Vermont and I had to drive through New York and uh, on my way back, I did much the same thing I did last week with a little rock hounding trip. Mm -hmm. And yep. they were saying you couldn't stay in a hotel if you didn't have proof that uh, you had quarantined. 
yes. right in some area and they were they were very serious about it and i think things are opening up a little bit more now but do you do remote um uh software work with any of these companies do you remote into their plant so in my current iteration as Kaplan, generally not. Uh, so, so part, I guess, I guess this brings up a good point, Frank. So, you, you know, uh, as I mentioned, I, I spent a couple of years, or maybe I didn't mention, I spent a couple of years running a systems integration firm, and that was the how do I become, you know, the, the digital nomad. And, and in 2015, when we were looking to make that move, you know, that was literally the term, right? Like, how do we become remote? And so for that, it became a lot of doing software work. It became a lot of remoting in. And for me, it became the, how do I, how do I continue to add value? How do I continue to do the parts of the job that I enjoy doing, you know, helping set up the project, um, helping make sure that it succeeds, bringing the adoption, making sure that we can actually train the folks on the systems that we build so that they can actually get the value and continue to build the, the client relationship. So for me, it's how do I, how do I continue to, to go down that path? And as part of that, I have done less and less development. Um, over the years. And that was at least in part, well, I think that was mostly intentional because I, I have always found that the flexibility of my schedule, you know, at some point you have to go on site, like you might have to go on site to commission and it may be, you know, you're on site for two weeks or, or three months. And so for me, it's the, how do I go and become more flexible and nimble in that? I certainly work with a bunch of folks who do a lot of remote software development, um, both before and currently. I generally don't do a lot of the, the remote software development personally uh, for, for those reasons that I that, that I listed. And and honestly, I'm a people person, Frank. As, as much as I want to like go hide in a cave sometimes, um, I, I love talking to people. I love I love helping to solve their problems. I love helping to you know, get it sold to upper management and make sure that, that it works uh, on the plant floor. Uh, and there are a lot of people that love kind of the, the technical in between. For me, the, the front and the back end and making sure that it goes and it works uh, is more fulfilling than, than the technical in between. Interesting. And you had also mentioned, I, I, I saw one of your comments the other day about a, uh, cybersecurity and you mentioned mm -hmm. a light managed, uh, light managed switch. Right. Yeah, I, I think uh, Rockwell and Stratus uh, have put out some sort of light managed switch. Uh, we, were, we were talking about managed switches versus unmanaged switches. And uh, the, the comment was someone saying that they, they had a sales guy saying that in like five years, they don't think they're going to be selling any unmanaged switches. And I was commiserating with how flat and unmanaged, uh, a bunch of unmanaged switches look on the network. And how I, I think that there's some sort of light managed switch or, or I'm completely losing my mind. Okay, that's interesting because yeah, I've, uh, I do a lot of that remote work. Uh, I, the yep. guest on, on my show here uh, twice has been a guy named Juan Pablo Garbine and he is I, one of my yep. major customers. Mm -hmm. uh, and we are doing a lot of that. We have a lot of plant network things. And of course we use uh, unmanaged switches for certain things. Yep. For instance, if all you have is a kind of a private network with some drives and an HMI and, you know, and you're going to get online with that particular PLC only, you really don't need much more than that. You're not necessarily, yeah. you're not drilling down to it, right, in any meaningful way. You, you may get into the PLC via a different port, uh, but, but that little network kind of takes care of itself, right? Mm -hmm. um, but cybersecurity is such a big deal now, and that is certainly not my specialty. Uh, so we've been having to investigate a lot of that, isolating things and using a lot mm -hmm. of uh, uh, routers and things mm -hmm. like that because we have things with the same addresses. And <laughs> I listened to that one. Yeah, there's no choice. I mean, you know, top tier, uh, they ship all their stuff and all their uh, drives have the same addresses and their PLCs have the same addresses. And we mm -hmm. don't want to change that. Um, for one thing, you get into some somewhat warranty issues if they do mm -hmm. have to come in and work on uh, their equipment. I, I think we're beyond that. Uh, most mm -hmm. of the equipment in that particular plant, uh, we handle all of it. Uh, we've honestly just, uh, we don't need a top tier. We don't need a Seidel. We don't need a Tetra Pak. Some of those uh, well-known people in the beverage industry, because we know the equipment well enough. It's just been a, enough time working on it that it's just now it's an object 
not a not a product from a specific vendor. So that that makes it easier. But yeah, cybersecurity is huge. So how much of your um, how much of your work is is related to that? Would you say now? So I. I feel like every time we bring up cybersecurity, I feel the need to like preface this by saying that I am certainly not the expert in ICS cybersecurity. I know and work with people who are quite literally experts who have literally written the books on, on ICS cybersecurity. Um, and so I, I feel the need to like always say that, that I am not the expert. I, I am certainly, you know, at the beginning stages of, of just trying to understand all of the different moving parts. Uh, so having said that, I certainly do some work in, in ICS. ICS cybersecurity. It has been an area that has interested me uh, for at least the last four or five years, and especially in the last probably two or three years, when we're starting to publicly see all of these issues uh, with facility with, with manufacturing facilities, with the water waste water facilities uh, of the, the you know the hacks and the ransomware. I think it's become more and more important, and and honestly, I continue to think to myself that. I continue to think to myself that people at some point need to start investing some more money in in at least understanding, right? So, and a lot of that is understand where you are so that you can either mitigate a risk or you can understand what your risks look like. And so the the lack of that, the the lack of interest and understanding that I see is a little frustrating, or maybe the the willingness to spend money is uh, is a little frustrating because of how important it is because of, of how disruptive it will be. So every year I do, you know, I work with either a couple of facilities or a couple of products um, towards the ICS uh, cybersecurity space. Uh, again, I'm, I'm certainly not an expert. I am, I'm trying to, I feel like most of the time I'm trying to learn like, uh, like a lot of other people. My, my goal when I talk about ICS cybersecurity is to kind of continue to get the word out, continue to have those conversations, continue to help, you know, small to medium facilities understand that they're almost certainly insecure. And because they're almost certainly insecure, they at least need to figure out what's going on so that they can pick, you know, do we want to continue to stay at risk? You know, do we potentially look at bringing in an external auditor? You know, what, what, do, what does that look like? Uh, I have seen I've seen, you know, facilities, enterprises that are five, six, seven facilities across the United States, you know, get taken down uh, both enter, both manufacturing floor and enterprise wise from, I was assumably a phishing attack. That, that, that's the best I got out of them. And I mean, they, they were down for like two months. And then when they came back up, they the the closest backups they had was for like approximately a quarter before that because they don't do a good job backing up. I see Tim laughing, but they don't do a good job backing stuff up. And so they were six months behind. And so in addition to having you know a, a large number of uh, of invoices that were outstanding, um, they literally have no idea what happened the last six months uh, of their facility. And so it, it's one of those things that we need to find a way to properly secure our our plants and our networks. And just generally speaking, if someone's goal is saying that their facility is air gapped, they're almost certainly not air gapped. Uh, I think I've seen one facility that said they were air gapped that actually were air gapped and almost everyone else you can get online to download software, right? Yep. Um, I was talking to some other folks in industry earlier this week and they say something like 5% of the facilities that they see and they certainly see and talk to a lot more facilities than I am who think they're air gapped are, are actually air gapped. So it, there's just, it's almost like we're opening the front door and asking people to, uh, to, to walk in. So when I talk about uh, ICS cybersecurity, a lot of it is trying to get that education out for people to actually take a look, for them to understand how costly it is to do nothing. And if they want to do something, either I can help them or I can get them in contact with people who certainly can go ahead and uh, and deliver on these projects. Ron Pablo, uh, he is kind of the, I as well as being the owner of the plant, he's the IT guy for sure and just monitoring the traffic and you can see the people that are trying to get in right mm -hmm. whether it's just a uh, 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 bulk you know uh, attacks or people actually trying to sneak in and find passwords it's constant and i want to say oh, yeah. he's got 10 to fifteen thousand a day 
directly hitting his specific facility. And he's just a little, you know, beverage manufacturer in Miami. And you can imagine how some of these bigger ones, and of course, we've read the the blogs and the stories about some of the bigger ones and, and people who actually do get into government facilities or major manufacturers or Microsoft or whoever. It's a, yeah. Uh, does anybody, uh, so I see there's a few people on here. Uh, are there anybody, any questions for, for Dave? I think that's always a fun thing to do. Anybody have any good, uh, Tim, yeah, you have any, any questions for Dave? Beard care questions? You guys both have a little bit of a beard there. So I, I would say Dave would be an expert at that. So, well, I, actually, I, one, I'll have to find a picture of it. One time, I did have a beard that would compete with Dave's. So, um, <laughs> I, I was in a challenge one time um, doing a fundraiser, and and that for twenty five dollars a day, I would raise, I would grow my beard. And at day one hundred, I was really close to him. So, wow, yeah, I, <laughs> that, that's pretty good. That that's pretty good. I, I will be, I will be interested to see that picture when it gets posted online, Tim. Uh, well, what was funny is one guy walked up to me one day. He said, well, how many days you got left? I said, I'm about out of money. He said, well, $500. I'll give you $500 if you want me to shave it off. So, yeah, I, I trusted a guy with a straight blade to shave uh, that thing off. Uh, okay. So, for, <laughs> so yeah. yeah, whenever you're ready, hey, um, I might pay you uh, to, uh, to shave that off. for a video. So, I actually got about six inches taken off yesterday, Tim. <laughs> It, it, was, it was getting a little long. When That's you go, I did like a little trim there. Uh, when, when you go in and you're like, and you, you tell the barber that you're like, you, you've passed Civil War general. Uh, you are like to the point of wizard. And, and then I'm like, and the only thing left is ZZ Top. And he looks at me with a dead face and he's like, you're already to ZZ Top. And I'm like, take two more inches off. <laughs> wow. Let's see. So I did have some other topics here. Any, any other questions? No? I see there's about seven or eight people here. Uh, so uh, being a digital nomad, one of the little notes I wrote down here, uh, when you were doing that preparation, do you have any, uh, for instance, influencers that you used either for that transition, such as uh, Tim Ferriss, he was a big influencer for me, mm -hmm. the four hour work week, uh, yep. you know, uh, I've had my own company for a long time, so that four-hour work week started looking pretty appetizing. I'd be happy with four hours a day, Frank. I'll, I'll be I'll be four hours before noon today. Exactly. How about Chris Gillibo? You familiar with him? I'm not sure I know Chris. So I am familiar with Tim Ferriss and the four-hour work week. I'm not sure I know Chris Gillibo. Um, so I guess the, the the goal of the goal of going to to work remotely was less the it was, it was, it was less the, you know, kind of work less. It was more the, so my wife and I had, had grown up and we spent some number of years in Western New York out near Buffalo. That's where he had family. And so when, by the time we were all done with school and I was ready to go find the, the, the next job, the next opportunity, it became the, there weren't any good opportunities there. So we moved down to Baltimore. And so we lived in Baltimore for about three years. And so I, I have family. Uh, for friends and family down in that area. So, so we, we lived there. And at some point, you know, six or eight months in, we had gotten to the point where we had driven everywhere that there was to drive. Like we, we had done the national parks, we had camped in Shenandoah and gotten frozen really good on an opening weekend. Um, in there, man, it got, I got cold at elevate. It got, well, three, 4,000 feet of elevation. It was, there was a hard freeze that night, but no. So we, we had done that. We had driven to all the battlefields. We had gone to all the places that you could realistically go in a day or camp over the weekend or, or generally, you know, burn through your vacation to go drive to and see. And it became the, we really love doing this. There is like literally 90% of the rest of the country that, that we have yet to see, right? Like we, we can legitimately drive to a national park. There are now like 61 others. So there, there are a bunch of others. And the question becomes the, how do we remove the, the necessity of being able to be in one place? And so, uh, so, so a lot of that was, yeah, a lot of that was how do we be able to travel, go visit all of these other places as we are working. And so that was, that was the, the real goal um, along the way. You know, I've certainly learned a lot along the way. And so most of the people that we were following were folks who were like RVing or traveling, um, some, some now boaters. Um, 
in uh, and doing that full time while they worked. And when we were looking at it in like 2015, 2016, before we left in uh, 2017, it became a it, it was a very it was a long process. Right. So I did. We didn't want to leave good jobs to potentially go to less good jobs. Um, yeah, we didn't want to leave good jobs to go to potentially less good jobs, at, at least at the beginning. And so it was, we were very selective, very picky as to what we wanted. And it took a while to find remote work opportunities, especially back then. I feel like now they're much more common. And I feel like in the job postings, it becomes the, if you want to hire top talent, you almost certainly are going to have to offer some amount of remote work flexibility or, uh, or capability, unless, you know, you're at a, like, unless it's, at a facility or in yeah basically unless it's at a facility most people are going to want the flexibility to be able to work from wherever they want after the last year of not very many people going into an office they don't want to have to you know wake up in the morning and go back into the office uh you know five days a week just to uh j just to have you know seats or butts in the chair if you will and uh and work from there so it's uh it's been interesting um and then i, I guess I guess that the other part of the question is if I have suggestions, um, I would say be particular as to who you look for, especially in this job market. The job market is great. Uh, you want to ask questions about, you know, the remote work and the remote work culture. And uh, you're going to find a couple of different groups. You're going to have, you know, the group that allows remote work, but 90% of the people are in the office. And that's, that's not a good way to succeed. Uh, that is a good way to be left out of every conversation and forgotten just in general. You, what you want is you want a company that supports remote and, you know, half or more of their employees are remote and, or, or they've got a bunch of offices. And it's a very common thing to do to have the conversations on Slack or Teams or email or conference calls, whatever that looks like. You want to, you want to make sure that you set yourself up for success and not set yourself up for kind of being ostracized because you're the only person that's working remotely. Right. I, I noticed uh, just on my list here that DeMarcus uh, joined us at some point and DeMarcus and I are gonna talk this afternoon, but uh, he is thinking of starting an automation company. And yeah. since we've got uh, some people on here who have done that, right? I was wondering if you, do you have any advice for people who are starting uh, they're, you know, going out on their own. I know I read, Tim, I read a lot of your history. <laughs> that was very interesting. Uh, it's on, of course, Tim's website and uh, how he got into the business he was in. You know, he was probably happy working for a manufacturer and then things kind of, uh, you know, sometimes things fall apart or whatever. The culture changes and all of a sudden you're sort of forced into going out and starting your own venture. And then some people like probably myself and Dave made the dis conscious decision, this is what we're gonna do. Uh, any advice from either one of you? Yeah, I will, uh, I will go first as, as I'm not sure Tim was expecting to, uh, to give advice. <laughs> but uh, so, so Tim, I'll give you a couple of, uh, couple of moments to, uh, to think of something really smart. But no, um, I, I would say, uh, and DeMarcus, I, I don't know kind of like what your current situation is, but if you have a job, uh, the, the best way to start this, as long as you're like not violating your non-compete or confidentiality or like going and trying to poach your, your current uh, company's business, is to, to find the opportunity to do some of this work, uh, you know, outside of your normal job and outside of your normal work and build up a client base. Uh, it, it, always takes it, it always takes longer to find clients than you think it's going to take. Uh, and because it always takes longer to find clients than you think it's going to take, you might have like six months of cash put away, but that six months of cash goes really fast, especially if you find some clients and they're like, yes, please buy some hardware, but I don't want to pay you for the hardware up front. And you're like, well, that's the last five, that, that is eight months of cash that I need to come up with uh, just to buy the hardware for this position. So I would suggest, you know, finding clients while you are gainfully employed and up until the point of, you have to make the, you cannot do both and you have to make the decision and make the jump. And I found that that's the easiest uh, transfer over. And I, I guess, cause I made the joke on the hardware side, 
I normally ask for, for hardware money um, up front, especially, especially for first time clients. Uh, don't be afraid to ask for terms that are, are very beneficial to you. You might think that you're asking for like a ridiculous price or that you're asking for crazy terms and you're going to be worried to send over the proposal and they're going to turn and most of the time they're going to turn it back around without even thinking about it. Yeah, actually, I'll butt in on that is don't be afraid to lose a job if they won't give you terms. I mean, there and there are, and there are certain companies that, you know, they just don't do it. And early on, um, I, I took a job on without terms because it was one of those that, no, we, we do not give any type of terms. And it nearly put, it nearly put us out of business. And really, look, that's one of those looking back at it. It's like, I should have never took on that job. I could have taken on so many other smaller jobs or found some jobs that would have taken terms. I mean, and the biggest part about it is when you are worried about how you are going to either feed your family or if you have employees, make that next paycheck, you're, you do not have 100% of your mind on that project. And so you won't sleep at night. Next thing you know, you're going to think you're having a heart attack. I mean, it can just drag you so far down as, you know, definitely stick on that one. And I, and I did, I had one later after that. That was actually a ridiculous, I mean, it, for everybody on this call, probably was a ridiculous amount of money. And at first they bucked me on terms. They're like, no, nah, we don't know if we can do terms on this. And I'm like, well, if I can't do terms and I can't do the job, and, you know, a week later, I, they sent me the PO with my terms. So stick to your guns on that one. I mean, if there's ever anything, you know, it, and of course, we did not do it the smart way like Dave did. You know, we did just do a podcast talking about it. But really, Amber and I quit our jobs seven months pregnant with our first kid. And by the time our son was born, we had less than $100 in the bank. I mean, you know, so... <laughs> We, did, we didn't do it the smart way, but if there's one thing I've learned through all that is, yeah, managing cash, managing all those things that are unrelated to automation is really key to being successful. Yeah. And related to that, uh, so I've done bu uh, business with some very large companies that net 90, you know, that's their normal thing. But if you have a good relationship with the engineer that you're working with, and, and that's a, you know, plant floor guy, a local guy, whatever, they know really what little side uh, uh, side doors there are to get the terms that you need or get advanced payment on things. And if you can form that relationship with that project engineer, manufacturing engineer, and, uh, and, and get trust on both sides, they can sometimes find solutions where, yeah, net 90 terms. Uh, I have one customer right now that that's what it is. But again, I'm not putting hardware in. I, I'm going and I'm doing some training and, and some consulting and it's just time. So I don't mind waiting my 90 days, but when you're starting to do things that involve a lot of hardware and you know down payments that the down payment may take 90 days, but yet I have to buy stuff now because they're always in a hurry, right? Uh, there are back doors, there are back doors. And sometimes you just have to tell them, well, net 90, uh, when I receive your check, I'll start ordering parts. <laughs> you know, yep. uh, They don't like to hear that, but, but, and that engineer that really needs that on time, may be the guy who can get you in the side door. So that's another yeah, thing to think about. And also those net 90 companies usually aren't looking for the cheapest people either. No, Remember that true. part that they're, you know, um, that you, you need to get paid for, for that pain of waiting. I mean, so oh, yeah. make sure you put that in there. Yeah. And, and I would say kind of adding to that is it may be uncomfortable, but I would not shy away from having money conversations with the folks before you send them the proposal. Um, generally speaking, I don't want people to be surprised how much something costs when I send them the proposal. Uh, you know, th there are every once in a while, there'll be those, con th there'll be those ones that they're like, hey, can you tell me what this is? And, and I'll kind of put together the boilerplate, and, you know, this is the cost because it it's whatever it is. But if you're doing a, a job, you should understand, you know, what, what their needs are. And you should be able to have that, you know, open, honest conversation. There'll, there'll be lots of times where you're like, oh man, I might be able to bill this at 110 bucks an hour. And 
they're currently paying, you know, $150 an hour for something like that. Or you can look at rolling all of that together in a project if you spec the project out correctly, and you can make, you know, twice that if you have the ability to, uh, to go through and get it done quicker. But generally speaking, it's a hard conversation to have the first time, but be like open about the money. And I've had lots of conversations with people of like, hey, do you have a budget for this? And I've had lots of people tell me how much their budget was. And if you know how much their budget is, it's a lot easier to spec out a system for 50 grand or 200 grand than it is to be like, I could do this for $50,000 or I could do this for $5 million. They probably aren't going to pay $5 million, but I want to give them the most system that they can possibly afford. Yeah. Uh, an old mentor of mine used to say, money buys speed. How fast do you want to go, right? Yes. <laughs> Okay, so other topics that I put, yeah, building consulting relationships. I think we both breezed over that, you know, uh, that it takes a while. Sometimes people say it takes, you know, seven meetings or, or seven points of contact before you'll start getting business from somebody before they trust you enough to start doing business with you. I don't know that that's always true. Sometimes people come to you for a specific product and you're able to Okay, here's what I do. Yeah, okay, well, you're hired. <laughs> I, I've, I have had, you know, the first conversation, you walk into the boardroom, you, you show them what you can do, and they're like, I want to hire you. How much does it cost? And it doesn't matter what the price is. You say you shake hands and you walk out on the first meeting. But I've also had those relationships where it's five years in the making before anyone finds a way to, uh, find, finds a way to make money on that. Uh, I think it's, it's important to continue to, be part of your community to have those conversations and not to forget about people because they currently don't have money to spend on the uh, the products and offerings that you have. Man, don't let the no's discourage you. I mean, you especially starting out when you have zero name. And actually, that was, that was something I was going to say before, and then I forget, uh, got off on a rabbit trail. But you know, you're working at a company right now start acting like it's your company start representing your now don't start you know saying hey i'm, I'm gonna start business soon so don't forget me but really start portraying yourself as somebody that you know would want to be hired uh but when you have zero name there's a lot of no's there's a lot of no's just trying to get somebody to answer the phone or open a door for you and don't let the no's discourage you because yeah that first yes that that'll It'd be well worth it after that. I think that's a tough thing, especially now, right? With, uh, with COVID, there is probably less business, and it's certainly harder to make a personal relationship with people. Uh, mm -hmm. Brian is on here. He's, he, he was a guy I talked to yesterday. I know uh, Brian is, is going through some of this, too. He works a lot with wastewater clients. And uh, he's, uh, you know, finding it a little hard now to go out and find some of the new clients. Maybe some of the old businesses dried up a little bit. Um, any comments there, Brian? There, I think I'm unmuted. There, no, yeah, you are. Yep. Yes, it's <clears throat> the COVID thing has really killed my main marketing program, which was go out to lunch with people. Because <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's where I would, you know, see what people are up to and um, hear about... Um, you know, what's coming up next for them. I don't know, just, I know, I have a lot of friends. I've worked here for a long time in Seattle and I have a lot of friends who are still in consulting and some who are in contracting. And so, yeah, my method has just got wrecked by COVID. Now my first shot is in, so I'm coming up on freedom in June, I believe. So <laughs> that's my... <laughs> Well, so we'll see what that does, right? The, uh, the, the opening up and the, uh, gosh, they're talking about vaccine passports and, uh, you know, proof that you've been inoculated. Now, over the past year, uh, oddly enough, they have brought me into several plants where the state's almost shut down. And we do. We wear masks the entire time we're in there. And, you know, it's yeah. kind of hard talking behind a mask and, uh, you know, explaining things. And they can't see your expression. They don't know if you're serious or not. I know. <laughs> I know. But, and yeah. thank you for the thank you for that quick discussion about money. That's always been my uh 
one of my least favorite parts of being in business for myself was asking for money, at least the right amount anyway, and then figuring out the right amount and then asking for it and, and being confident that, yeah, this is, this is the right thing to do. <laughs> I, I think it's, that's, it's always hard. And in my experience, you don't necessarily know how much something is worth until you start getting a series of no, that's too expensive. And so it's the, maybe you need to price something with one thing. And then the next time you, you, you add a little bit more up until the point that you know that you, you've found how much the market will bear. Yeah, and things like, you, you know your own rate, of course, right? And then yep. products, uh, so we've had a, uh, one of the webinars, we had Doug Allward on here, and Doug is an applications engineer, and he talked a lot about pricing of systems and risk mitigation. And there are times where you don't just want to go into a customer and say, this is your solution, and it's going to cost this much. And then you get into it, and you find out that the solution doesn't quite work the way that you thought it was going to work because you didn't have experience in that area. There are always unknowns, right? So uh, he, he said, you know, it takes uh, for a fixed price bid for most machinery uh, projects, it takes a month. And uh, that's a month of getting quotes from your vendors, firm quotes, right, for the hardware and things like that, and really almost designing the system. And you can't yeah. afford to do that. You can't afford to design the system for free for the customer in the hopes that you'll get it when there's a 10% chance of you getting it or something. So that's tough. Exactly. And, uh, yeah. So one of the things that I've been doing, Frank, in the last you know year or so is kind of how, how do I get into these conversations before the before the proposal comes out, right? So be it a machine build or be it anything else, it's most of the time I find by the time you get to someone has written a request for proposal, um, the requirements aren't good. The functional specs might not be good. They may or may not know what they actually need it to do. And so I have found success in how do I get there in the beginning? How do I go through and either consult with them? Uh, yeah, yeah. How, in this instance, it would be the, how do you go in and consult with them and help them write what they actually need so that they actually can get something that they want and find a way to be able to show them value. And even if you don't get the, I mean, ideally you would want to get the machine build, but even if you don't get the machine build, you know that you will make the money that you would have spent over that kind of guess. And, and I actually know a lot of people who are very successful in just doing that and no longer worry about the potential risk of building the machines anymore because they can go out and they can consult and they can get in on the ground floor. And so generally with my process, it's the, how do we go out? How do we get in on the ground floor to be able to have these conversations to build a set series of requirements that actually are going to work and are going to do the project that they want as opposed to the, this is what we think we need. Let's put it out in an RFP. Let's get 10, uh, let, let's get 10 proposals back. None of them are exactly the same. Six of these people have read most of the words, but only one of them has read all of the things. And while we do want them to agree to it, like we're going to accept their proposal and they've just left a whole bunch of stuff out. And some of these guys have asked questions and how do we go through the proposal process? Like w the, the larger the projects you get into with that, the, uh, the, the more and more frustrating and confusing it could be. And so the, the largest project that I ever did kind of build wise was, was an aircraft facility. And I was the guy in charge of like designing this. And I laugh because it was like more than 10 years ago. And we lit, did it on a boardroom table in a conference room. And we had engineering graph paper and we were moving the pieces, the machines and the pieces of the airplane. And I think back to myself and I'm like, man, if I could do that today, there are just so many better ways to do it. But like we go through this and we go to, we go to propose it. And there are like 300 PowerPoint slides and it's a four, it's a, it's a loose four hour meeting. Like I thought these guys were joking when they said loose four hour meeting. Uh, we took every minute of those four hours, Frank, we, we could have gone for seven. We took every minute of those four hours. And then it, it was just to the point of, you know, we, we went in and we did a fantastic job and they're like, man, it look it sounds like you guys are the only ones that actually read our RFP package, and it, it's just it's it's just one of those things that there are just like hundreds of pages in an RFP for that, and probably less so in in many you know machine builds. 
but of it's almost you're picking the best of a variety of not great options for facts inclusive of you know you almost have to spend a month getting firm quotes back and then also designing the machine before you can tell them how much the machine is going to cost so you've got a really good estimator and the estimators like this is generally what it costs and then maybe you put your your markup on top of it so my goal has been how do i get into the process before we get to that so that I can direct it in a way that makes the most impact, that, that, that makes sure that we can actually, you know, deliver on the project. And there's often- I've done that a, a few times on, I do pure consulting. I don't sell any, any okay. equipment. Um, but being in on the ground floor is definitely helpful. I, I've had some success being able to design the project and then compete and, and say, you know, I'll do it. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. So, so Brian, I guess specifically with that. So uh, one of my initiatives this year has been to, to get further in and to, to offer, you know, a variety of road mapping or discovery processes specifically for that. And it's a, you know, generally a, a fixed cost depending upon what the project or the system looks like. And for me, it's kind of that, that leader into how can we go show them what we can do. And if we do a good job writing it, one, we know what it's going to be. They're basically paying us to tell them what the project is going to take. And then two, if we want to do the project, and one of the nice parts is it kind of gives you an out, right? Like you could be like, this is going to go sideways. We should not be part of it. Um, you know, they don't have the right people processes and procedures in place to do it. So it, it could potentially give you an out. But if this is a job that you want to do, it would be a good opportunity to kind of direct and, and help make sure that you can, uh, you, you can deliver on the project. Right, right. That makes perfect sense. Well, we're right up against, uh, the, the hour here, um, any other questions for Dave or comments? Anything? Anybody? But he's most been very helpful. Thank you. Yeah, I, you know, uh, all these discussions. It's it's kind of different every every uh, every week, and it's been really interesting. I've always been curious about all the things Dave does because they they have some very informative uh, webinars, the manufacturing hub webinars, uh, you know, they've had everything from, uh, recruiters to systems integrators to different people. And Dave always seems to know a lot about the subjects being discussed, which is, uh, always valuable. So, uh, we do this webinar every two weeks. Uh, this might be something some of you are interested in the next webinar two weeks from now is with Tatsoft. Don't know if anybody has heard of Tatsoft but everybody's heard of ignition, right? Uh, right, yep. ignition's out there, and every it's the great new thing. And I propose it even, even to uh, people I don't know. I say, you know, ignition's this great platform, etc. And then all of a sudden, Tatsoft comes out, and Tatsoft's like, okay, well, hey, this is a little less expensive than ignition, and it seems to do everything that ignition does. So that's kind of a neat thing. And Tolgar and I have been uh, communicating a little bit back and forth. Um, I think he's mostly their marketing guy. And then Harry and I uh, talked in terms of ABD, right? ABD, American Beverage Depot, uh, is a big ignition user. Uh, but they, they've they run into this situation where they have to either upgrade their ignition license, which is going to cost what the original ignition license cost, uh, to get into the mobile platforms, right? They're, they're, they've come out with this new perspective uh, thing And so the opportunity is there for them to jump into something like Tatsoft, but then the other side of it is now you have two uh, software packages that you have to learn. And since Juan Pablo himself does a lot of that work, he, you know, he doesn't farm a lot of that particular stuff out other than to me, uh, do we really want to go down that route of learning an entirely new platform? So it'll be interesting finding out from them, you know, uh, what are the similarities? They know a lot, of course, about Ignition. What's the learning curve? How hard is it to move from one to the other? Uh, I think they're also coming out with another one of those schools like Inductive University. Um, and they have a lot of history. I think, uh, who's the guy who started it? He was the Indusoft inventor. He was the original guy who started uh, Indusoft and he's 
part of Taps Off now. I think he's one of the founders of it. So it'll be interesting talking to all those guys. But uh, Dave, this has been great. Uh, I, I, again, learned a lot. And um, again, Dave Griffith dot com with a hyphen dash Dave hyphen, hyphen dot com yep hyphen hyphen there we go Dave Griffith dot com and I copied that directly from the website and of course you can download or read uh, his document which is the type digital transformation the digital transformation quick start guys quick start uh, guide, there's yeah. there's an infographic there's a bunch of posts tied to that on the website there's a video in which i uh, I, I take you through it um as well and then if anyone listening to this has any questions uh please feel free to reach out uh please feel free to uh, connect with me on linkedin i think there are a couple of folks here that who i'm not connected with uh please feel free to uh, to connect with me on linkedin that uh that's probably the best way to have a, a quick conversation or trade a couple of messages and of course other than that you can of course uh uh shoot an email through uh through any of my emails on, on the website and we can have a conversation about that as well Excellent. And Tim, it was great to see you. Uh, Tim is one of the people on my list that I would eventually love to have as a guest. Uh, Tim does a lot of things. We've, we've kind of uh, exchanged, you know, a couple of uh, pieces of information. I, I got into producing products a few years ago myself and kind of ran into a wall. Uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a one person company. Tim is kind of, uh, I know you build systems and do some panel building and, and of course teach and things like that. But, uh, uh, at one time, my children were involved in my company now, but they're in their mid thirties now. They've all grown up and they're still involved in a way. One's a web developer. So uh, my daughter owns a branding company here in Nashville. They mostly work with healthcare and things like that, but she does maintain my site, uh, which, so I get, a, I get a little help from there, but I don't get help on fabrication. Uh, thought about even having, you know, high school students come in and do a lot of the work, but I just don't have the time and the bandwidth to do some of that. So here I have these products uh, and, and uh, I use them for myself. There are a lot of the things that are behind me on this wall here and good ideas, but I think I'm going to be more selling the plans for the products rather than building products because it's, it's time intensive. And I'd love to hear more from Tim at some point about how he got into that. I've got a lot of your little gadgets, the little, the little ethernet uh, uh, boot P device. Very cool. Um, I, I need to get the servo simulator, the little, uh, yeah, that, that looks like a cool tool. So, so love to have you on Tim at some point and talk about your products. Uh, you know, uh, pretty open every two weeks. The next one, of course, was with tats off, but after that, no, no, nobody on my schedule. So Tim, if you're interested. Yeah. Any way I can help, any way I can help grow our industry. And I think the same deal there. I mean, once you figure out that maybe not everything has to have a profit, yeah, you can figure out how to make it work. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, getting back and getting involved, especially with young people, right? Uh, bringing them into this industry and whether we're teaching them or providing, you know, information, whether it's free information or a platform or whatever, it's all very worthwhile. Um, well, thanks thank for putting this on. And of course, I always enjoy hearing from Dave. Dave, yeah. when are you coming to Virginia again? I don't know, Tim. We're we're going to be out west for for a bit. I I will let you know when we're heading down to uh, heading down to Virginia. We, ever right. since you, ever since you sent me that link of land out by you, uh, but Beth and I Beth and I have been scrolling through. It's like well, but that the million dollar view got sold last week, so we're going to have oh. to find another one. Well, we we didn't have a million bucks to buy a view out there um, <laughs> and, anyway, so. <laughs> We, we, we may we may be waiting until all the city folks decide that they don't like living in the middle of the forest and then have to sell again in a couple of months. Yeah, I mean, my buddy, don't, you know, you know, buddy of mine, he he develops land. He he develops ridiculous views in the country, and you cannot develop land fast enough right now. It's unreal. Yeah, but yeah, well, eventually, I think our, a lot of them are going to figure out they don't like to drive. Yep, that, that's that's what I'm waiting on, Tim. And I'm hoping internet make good internet makes it uh, out to that part of the world before they realize that they don't like to drive. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Tim lives in Roanoke. For those of you who didn't uh, know that, and I drive through there all the time because I'm doing stuff up uh, up the East Coast. So I drive right through Roanoke. Usually stay uh, in a hotel, you know, somewhere near there on the way through. And it is kind of God's country. It's a beautiful oh, yeah. area up in the mm -hmm. uh, mountains and everything uh well it's been great uh talking to you guys and uh 
again, get a, get a hold of Dave, davegriffith.com, uh, you know, connect to us all on LinkedIn. We're all there and uh, hopefully providing content and it's been great to, great to talk to everybody. Thank you. And thanks. We'll all right, thanks. Thank you, Frank. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.